learn how to work a broken system, hotwire the engine, blending, camouflage like a chameleon. In the queue out of rock bottom, the still poverty, poverty hierarchy, wait for your number to be called, the anxiety lottery, humans in boxes like collectible action figures, value goes up depending on the condition. Different levels of pain, allow you to skate the rain, learn to play the game, navigate through that maze, aiming for the high score, treading through the labyrinth, battling the minotaur. Nothing left to lose, but still got to prove, like a reality TV show, survive through the votes. I'm in poverty, get me out of here. The million pound question is near. There's no 50-50, you can't phone a friend, but please tell us your most traumatic experiences again and again, and we'll decide whether you're worthy to have a roof over your head. Big Brother is watching, and bucks ticking. Doesn't see individuals, only numerical. Numbers scan like barcodes, so the basket's full. Oscar Wilde said charity creates a multitude of sins. I know myself that I need that redemption. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. In a battle between compassion and ego, ego is a reigning champion. Be the change that you want to see, like Gandhi. Is it really social change if it's not caught in a selfie? If a revolution happens and no one hits like, is it even worth the fight? Giving a blanket so they can be warm at night, or is it so you can sleep soundly tonight? Giving back to pat yourself on the back. We can all hand out, need to hand up, or go hands free. Allow humans to live independently. A tree has many roots. If a couple are damaged, the branches droop. Don't bear fruit, the flowers don't bloom. Could be more than, more than one root cause. No big mystery to crack, this isn't Scooby-Doo. And when you pull off that mask of labels, you see it's a human being who's a monster of his tail. Like Scooby-Doo with the corridor chase scenes, doors just opening and closing, leading back to the place you've been, a whirlpool spinning, a vicious cycle, a stationary spiral, repeat and recycle, clinging onto that feeling of humanity, repetition, repetition, a definition of insanity, more than meets the eyes, we categorise like the identity parade or the guess who game, we think you know the portrait in that frame, don't want to be the subject of the picture, people fear that stigma, stigma comes from a Latin word, to scar or brand, people aren't so quick to ask for help in hand employment and benefits, balancing the scales of justice, paychecks or safety nets, can't pay the bill, thinking moving forward, stand still, like running on a treadmill, foot in shatters, property snakes and ladders, a house is a structure, bricks and mortar, home isn't made up of the clutter in them lifestyle magazines, you want to feel alive in a living room, not caught in a catacomb, a plant to water, a shop on the corner, a turn of a key that boosts your self-esteem, part of a community, just want to be treated like a human being, people and human beings are words I keep on saying, I know it's wretched writing, Shakespeare will put a plague on my house, the poet society will cast me out, but put yourself in their shoes and try and walk their journey, pull them laces up tight, we need an epidemic of empathy, repair breakages with gold like Japanese bowls, some fall from grace but they can soften the blow, teach them to tuck and roll, hidden homeless makes it sound like a secret, we're worried we'll get told, between all the headlines, strap lines, flags and tags, I think we forget, we've got to dismantle, be critical, put aside what's yours and listen to the wisdom from behind closed doors. Um, my name is Joe Cook and I'm a, a musician and a poet from Birmingham and I'm involved in Mayday Trust and yeah in case you're wondering who's this like curly haired man just rapping at me in the morning you are in the right zoom so yeah I'm going to put myself on mute now but thank you for listening. Thanks, Joe. That was brilliant. And welcome, everyone, to a session or day three, I should say, of the New System Alliance launch. Um, and what a way to kick it off. That was um, so, just incredible. So I hope that gets us thinking um, really um, powerfully about how words and language um, can inspire us and move us. Um, yeah, so thanks, Joe. And we'll um, look forward to hearing some of your views as well um, throughout today. So. Um, my name is Oliver Townsend. Uh, I'm here today uh, to kind of slightly chair, facilitate whatever this discussion might turn into being. Um, one of the things uh, I really want this session to be about today um, is trying to understand what the impact of our words and our language can be. Um, so we've got a really amazing panel of people, which I'll ask to uh, introduce themselves uh, shortly. Um, I just want to have a kind of a bit of a chat about how this session will work. So uh, feel free to engage in the chat. I can already see 50 notifications. Um, so I know people don't need uh, telling twice to get involved. Um, I want this to be a debate, a discussion, uh, for a space to challenge each other. Um, but pre predominantly for me, it's a space for us to be um, you know, kind and human as well. And um, I think people have very uh, different views on language, on words. 
Um, so I don't want anyone to be judging each other or attacking each other, but really to debate with the content, really. So uh, without further ado, because I'm not the important one today, I'd just like to pass over, first of all, to Bryony uh, to kind of introduce herself. Thanks, Oliver. And um, hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's uh, it's really exciting. I think the whole the whole platform, the whole movement in this week is a, is a really great celebration of a, just a completely different way of working. Um, and Joe, I thought that was amazing. What a great way to kind of kick off this session. Um, so I'm kind of here because I'm really passionate about the language that we use, particularly in social care, but generally. Um, and I really do believe in a much more human future um, where we talk a lot more about things like love and um, relationships and people and communities and hope and rights and a lot less about beds and um, service users and customers and the vulnerable and the elderly and all those kind of hideous groups that we hear a lot of, especially right now during coronavirus. Um, yeah, so that's me. Great, thanks, Bryony. And then in alphabetical order by first name, uh, Catherine, next. Thanks, Oliver. Just to echo what Bryony has just said, um, I'm really excited to be here um, today. And also, thanks to Joe for what a brilliant start. If only I could write it all down. <laughs> quickly enough. Um, so my name's Catherine, I work for Crisis. Um, I'm leading the Crisis Framing Homelessness project. Um, and I've never really thought of myself as an activist until today. Um, I was thought it was a bit too quiet to do that, but I, but I guess I am. Um, I'm working to support the homelessness sector across the UK to tell, to tell a new story about homelessness that leaves behind inevitability and poor choices um, and starts to shine a light on systems and structures that trap people in poverty, that force people into homelessness um, and to help explain the solutions. Great, thanks Catherine. And then uh, last but not least, Sarah. Hello, hi, echoing everything that's been said. Um, very pleased to be here this morning and and yes again thank you joe that was that was amazing um and really impactful to come in and that this morning um so i um i'm here as, as well because um i feel passionate about language and i have delivered a lot of training over the years and if anyone who's attended the train my the training i've delivered knows that i go on about it a lot um so <laughs> it's good to be in a space where i can do that more um so i, I currently work at, at, at changing lives um i'm working on on the alliance at, at changing lives um, and I've just come from May Day, so I was at May Day for five years. Um, and I think I'm excited as well today to explore how language can be in that kind of activist space and influence as well, and how we can use it for that. So um, I'm excited to explore that today. Great, thanks, Sarah. And yeah, as someone who's been on uh, the training Sarah's run, language is definitely key in that. So uh, yeah, I'm a little bit intimidated by the panel. So I'm just gonna be the ineffectual kind of male at the top of it all, just kind of like pretending that I know what's going on. Um, meanwhile, people actually know what they're doing can contribute. So um, in typical um, male fashion, I've decided to copy uh, a better idea from someone else earlier in the week. Uh, so anyone who was here on uh, Tuesday morning saw math pots asking people to get spoons. Uh, well, I didn't have time and I didn't want to make it quite so obvious I was copying. So instead I've asked people to get either a writing implement or a piece of paper. So I've got my unicorn fairy pen, um, which is the first time I've used it in a professional setting. So uh, hopefully that doesn't ruin the serious nature of what we're talking about. Um, and the idea is people on the screen, if they want to come in, will wave their writing implement and then I'll call them in. So uh, just a bit of uh, silliness to break up the, the conversation. Um, I was going to start off really, and I'm probably going to give um, some people at New Sister Alliance uh, organisers a bit of a, a heart attack now because I'm going to try and uh, not follow the script too much. Um, I was just going to open with a bit of an example really of um, why why for me language is really important and I think for me um, it comes from a lot of my experience um, working, not working, uh, having experienced uh, being a patient in a hospital setting. So I was just going to share a really quick story. Um, and the caveat to this is it's all fine now, I'm all happy, so it's okay. Um, 
I was in hospital um, with a big sort of frame on my leg for club foot, talipes, and um, had an infection in it on a bank holiday weekend. Um, I was in Sheffield Children's Hospital at the time, but I was kind of 19 because they didn't want to discharge me into the adult setting yet. So it was a bit complicated. Um, and um, I'm a larger person than a lot of people. Um, so that's the kind of context. Um, and I was going in for a routine kind of um, they do a bit of an incision, take out whatever the infective stuff is and do it, take it to the lab. So it was a really routine uh, operation, um, but it had to be under general anaesthetic. So I went in, kind of wheeled down in the cold kind of uh, porter trolley with the weird cream on your hands with the rattling of the, the wheels. And you go into these really empty sort of um, kind of operating theatre and um, there was a locum anaesthetist there. So I didn't know what locum meant until I met this um, person I think it means like a supply teacher version of a of a doctor um and as I was wheeled in um <laughs> she said what's that about me um and I thought oh I must have misheard she m must have thought what's that hat and but I'm not wearing a hat so what what should could she possibly have meant about the patient uh and she said it again what's what's that I can't be expected to do anything with that and, and I was thinking, have I died? Am I, <laughs> have I turned into a, a sort of slab of meat on a counter or something? And she's not even a surgeon. So um, I, I kind of just sort of froze. And then she said, well, is there anything I need to know? And I said, um, I don't know why I was trying to engage like a human being at this stage, but I just said, oh, well, I'm a bit scared of needles. And she said, well, I can't do anything about that now, can I? Anyway, uh, she put me to sleep. I woke up and it was uh, Monday morning and it was all fine. But what that left me with was this idea that I was nothing. I wasn't even human at that stage. I was, I was just a body that she was there to put to sleep so I could be chopped up. And the way that made me feel in those moments before being put to sleep, you know, in, in what is a, any anaesthetic is potentially risky, um, was just totally worthless. And that stayed with me, that happened when I was 19 and I'm now 32. So that stayed with me for a long, long time. So that's my story. And when, you know, there's lots of other examples which will probably come out uh, during the conversation. Um, and that's kind of what, how I wanted to start it off for me is actually sometimes we use language as a way uh, as professionals to shield ourselves from what we do. So, you know, I don't hold any major anger, I hold a bit, but I don't hold major anger towards the anaesthetist um, because maybe that was her way of, of having that professional boundary of her taking on um, some quite traumatic situations, you know. So that's kind of how I'm feeling is, you know, it's understandable maybe, but also it does really, as someone who's receiving that service, it makes you feel second best, worthless, and, and like, to be honest, not safe. You're not worthy of anything. So I just thought I'd start off with that story and just see if um, anyone has anything else they want to add. Looking for any waving pens. There we go, Sarah. Um, thank you for, for sharing that all. And um, I think it, it's really, um for me really highlights how dehumanizing that, that the language can be. And it's something that I've, I've definitely experienced. So I worked in, um, in homelessness services um, and I was in kind of like panel meetings, you know, meetings where everyone comes together and talks about cases. And actually the lot of the language that in those meetings is very kind of distanced and othered in a sense. Like, and I heard some really shocking stories about people, really personal things that have happened to them in these meetings, which were shared quite, um, flippantly in a sense in, in these meetings and kind of going like bracing yourself going whoa okay this doesn't seem totally normal to be sharing really intimate detail about people's lives but it it does feel like it's that kind of distancing that um people get from kind of the people that they're, they're working with in that othered kind of sense in a, in a sense maybe to protect themselves um and and not be too close to it i feel but it's something i've definitely seen a lot um working in services yeah, and I think for me, that's a really key point as well, because it, it means that the service responses to that are only ever going to be service responses. They're not going to be human responses, because if you only see people as either their labels or uh, that, you know, th then it's going to be really hard to have that person led supportive service that, that actually or no service at all that, that people want. Uh, Bryony, I saw your pen or Byro wave it. 
<laughs> yeah, I feel like my pen's a bit inadequate, really. I feel like everyone's got a more exciting pen. So <laughs> should have been more prepared. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's loads to pick up on there. I had a similar experience with a friend in hospital, which I, I, I write blogs about language and I actually wrote a blog about that experience and just the way that she and other people were talked to in there about, I think there's something about the one in chair one over there and um, those and all of, all of those kind of words that are just distancing and putting up those barriers between the pe people working in the system and the people that were there to support. And just the way people are talked about as cases and referrals and it's it's very dehumanizing totally dehumanizing yeah Catherine thank you just to pick up um what Sarah's Sarah and both Sarah and Bryony have been talking about othering language um and discussions of that really resonates with people when I'm having running sessions on framing homelessness it's something that um people are very concerned about and really eager to learn how to talk about homelessness and how to refer to people facing homelessness without othering um, and the answer is there's really simple ways to do that and it's uh, avoiding the homeless and instead using people facing homelessness or people experiencing homelessness. Really simple changes can make a huge difference in this space. And I think when, I, when I've spoken to, to colleagues with lived experience of homelessness, the difference is massive just by stopping using rough sleepers and referring to people facing rough sleeping or people experiencing rough sleeping. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a real, issue that has really simple solutions. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, oh, Bryony just picked you to the post, Sarah. Sorry, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think very much that getting, a, getting rid of the, the the in terms of the kind of the vulnerable, the disabled, um, the homeless, and talking about people, the person. Um, and also not things like saying pe people suffering from, uh, people suffering from dementia. Um, and those, are, again, those is one of my obsessions at the moment, the way that people are talked about as those who are vulnerable and those with dementia. Um, is a, yeah, I've noticed that more and more at the moment. And it's one of those things, once you see it, then <laughs> you can't unsee it. <laughs> it's very annoying. Um, we've just been having a real debate over the last, I don't know, six months about vulnerability um, and trying to find ways to express um, higher risk exposure to coronavirus without going down the road of describing people as the most vulnerable in our society yeah. and thinking of ways that we can do that in a more productive um, productive manner yeah Sarah yeah I was I was going to pick up on just kind of I think it kind of rolled into something else now but kind of um, it's interesting Catherine you're saying having that debate because for me the thing about language as well and I can almost I've, I've had many sessions where I've spoken to people about language and I get many an eye roll and many a, <laughs> oh, you're being very PC. And, and, and I, I get a lot kind of people kind of resisting it because it feels like we're kind of imposing quite a lot on people to, to think about their language because language is really personal and it comes out of your mouth and it's something that, that you control. Um, and it's interesting, this kind of debate on language. And I, I saw a tweet yesterday kind of saying, um, I won't say who it was from, but saying like, are we really going to debate person-centered or person-led? And I, and I found this really fascinating because, yeah, I think we really, really should debate person-centered or person-led. <laughs> I, because actually language is the like tip of the iceberg in terms of all the attitudes, all the thinking, all the approach. And if we can kind of get in there, actually, let's have a debate about what person-led means, and what person-centered means, because in my mind, they mean two very different things. And the resulting actions from those words are very different. And, and it, it's kind of... And that, after a long time at Mayday where I've sat in many a room debating many words and sometimes being completely exacerbated and being, oh gosh, I can't believe we're still talking about this word. I think there's something so important about continuing that debate and actually realizing the action that can come from that. Um, yeah. I think that's a really important one. And I'll come bring you in in a second, Brody. I, I think, um, you know, I think I saw similar tweets yesterday and, and I'm always, I'm just going to say it. Um, <laughs> I'm always surprised by 
how no i'm never surprised Let, let's change it i'm never surprised that the majority of people who say language doesn't matter are heterosexual cisgendered white middle class men and uh, i'm not making any assumptions where that tweet came from some of my best friends are cisgendered heterosexual white middle class men but um if you are someone who is in any way struggled, someone who is gay, trans, female, person of color, you know, and I've seen a comment in the chat about, you know, the lack of kind of diversity on this panel and, you know, hold hands up on that and we need to be better across the, the, the kind of system. Um, so, you know, thanks for the person who said that, it's a really important point and we will kind of make changes for that. Um, I don't often find people who have struggled kind of on the outside or being excluded um, from the system who think that language is meaningless because language, if you're excluded, is the thing that excludes you. And language, if you think about it, sorry to get all philosophical for a moment, um, <laughs> language is how we communicate with each other. So language isn't something that's just, oh, nice to have. It's not something we put on a shelf or a bookcase somewhere and forget about. Language is how you communicate with people. Language is how you tell people you're in pain. Language is how you tell people you're suffering. Language is how you challenge power. Language is how you express uh, solidarity with people. Language is how you communicate all of the things that make us human. And language is what separates us from, I don't know, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't really think this, but language is kind of what separates us from animals, you know? Like, so the idea that people will say language is not important, I just want to say, what planet are you on? <laughs> so, you know, sorry, that's more of a, that's not very systems based, sorry everyone, but that's more of a rant. I can see Joe waving. Do you mind if I bring Joe in first, Bryony, and then you? No, that's all. I just wanted to like bounce off a couple of points I heard. Um, the, the thing about language doesn't matter is like really interesting, but like to go back even further, like um, language is always like a very personal thing. If like um, throughout history, like the word spelling literally comes from to mean to cast a spell. So it was that you you would cast a spell and you would paint that image in someone's head. So it didn't matter about the grammaticalness as long as what you said portrayed. If you're telling someone that was a I don't know a goat, and you, and you said it in a different way, but they knew what you meant, the spell had been cast. So I think language is a really personal thing, especially with the diversity thing. Like I agree about the um the lack of diversity on the panel and stuff. And I also think that with that though, it's a lot of like, um, with diversity and identity, when it comes to language, it's a very personal preference as well. Um, because like, like for example, like my, like my family are like immigrants to this country on my dad's side. So I'm like Maltese, Irish and English um, uh, is my heritage. Um, I'm also have invisible disabilities, um, but I would never like, that's not a box. That's not like an option on a form and stuff like that. And um, I've also got friends uh, like my, some of my family like don't identify as that even though it's our genetic makeup and stuff like that they, they they feel more british because they've lived here for most of their life and stuff like that so I, I do think language and to be honest i don't think we talk about language i think we talk about labels and like um uh yeah i think it's like a very personal preference and just like an example that's coming to my head where, where people talk about the homeless um, like homeless people or rough sleepers or whatever we're going to call them. Um, I don't work that much within the homeless. I just volunteer when I can. But most of my work is within education, uh, working with young people. And I work um, in a couple of people with four units when I work with disengaged, vulnerable, blah, 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 blah. I don't know, like there's all these different like buzzwords. And I find for me, the more time I spent there, it kind of paints an image of them straight away. And often it's more down to their story. It's like who they are and why they've ended up in a place like that or their background. But if you hear like, oh yeah, it's like a, a school for naughty kids or something like that. You just immediately paint a picture. And like the last thing I just want to say about examples was just like, um, um, like so I was doing some workshops in Birmingham, in Aston, uh, in a youth centre in Aston. And um, we were doing writing workshops um, and the, the, the youth centre had called it poetry and they stuck poetry on the door. And like no one came in <laughs> for like two weeks. Like we just sat there. Uh, changed it to rap and lyric writing and everyone's in. Um, so it's just just an example. I know that's art, but yeah, it's just I think I think we sometimes lose track of how we, people interpret it on a very personal level. And I think it's good that language always evolves and stuff like that. You know, you can you can see that through slurs about history when people have took them for empowering and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a very it's really hard unless you're like a linguist or something like that, and you can uh, you can really break it down. It's a constant evolving and the the dynamic and the planes are constantly shifting and what you might used to describe one person they might disagree with themselves and stuff like that so yeah 
um, I think it's really interesting. Just, yeah, I know it's a bit of a ramble, but yeah. No, that was really, really, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit speechless, which is funny for a session on language. Um, just because of that language as a spell point that you just made, Joe, and that I think has just changed. <laughs> this sounds like so, it's changed my world straight away. Um, because actually, you know, Bryony and then I'll bring in Catherine after, but for me, language, boxes you in and language is so powerful so you know one of the things I, I have wrestled with for a long time is, is when I came out uh, in a Catholic school in South Wales you know that the language that surrounded me was really negative it boxed me in it caused shame and that was from sort of I don't know priests teachers kids you know family all of that and it and it kind of I, just you saying that about it being a spell has really made, kind of unlocked something there because actually I was never ashamed of myself until people started using their language, their spells to almost curse me into this shame. You know, it's a really interesting way of thinking about it. So thank you for putting that. I'll I, kind of a lot to reflect on. So I'm not going to do it in front of everyone because nobody needs to see that. Uh, <laughs> Bryony, then Catherine. Oh, there's so much to kind of comment on and reflect on <laughs> so many different points. I think my original thing that I was going to come in on was um, about the vulnerable and vulnerability words and the language particularly around COVID and um, just that that whole putting people in boxes really and it's very much about we, we need to ha attach a label and then we know what to do with you and then we can put you in a certain box um, and the vulnerable particularly I think has been it has been used as the vulnerable endlessly or the most vulnerable or even our most vulnerable in that kind of possessive we're talking about are, are vulnerable um, and as the, that sort of distinguishing people from there was the kind of hero narrative as well so you're either a hero or you're vulnerable and um, that's really dividing um, and I don't know I've got so, <laughs> so many points on that but I think just that whole sort of ticking boxes and putting people into boxes and not looking labeling people as a problem basically so you're not looking at why people are vulnerable or even what people are vulnerable to um, and what's made people vulnerable. So like this whole kind of narrative around people in care homes are vulnerable because of their age. But look at all of the reasons that they have been more vulnerable in terms of kind of policies around hospital discharge and lack of PPE and the whole kind of warehousing of people in these huge homes anyway. So those things get missed really. And there seems to be that kind of inevitability about people are gonna die, they're gonna die anyway because they're old and vulnerable rather than looking rather than focusing on the things that can prevent that happening so i think it is actually a really dangerous label yeah definitely um catherine thanks ollie yeah i just wanted to um to respond i guess to the idea of the power of language to influence thinking um and this isn't just about having a gut feeling that it does that we've got a lot of evidence around this and when you look at framing evidence and framing research you can when you look at testing different frames with with people you can see how using language to talk about an issue in a different way has an immediate impact on the way that people think about that issue um, can influence people to talk about something differently after just reading one small message framed in a certain way. And what's really interesting about the responses that we see from people in that research is that um, they think of that different idea as their own. So they'll say things like, I always say that, or in my view that, even though just a few minutes before, they said something completely different. So it's this idea that people actually retain a lot of different views about the same thing and in our in our communications in our language we can work to surface the really helpful ones and work to not activate the ones that are less helpful and more harmful um, and it absolutely that evidence absolutely shows the power and influence that making small changes to our language can have yeah and that brings me oh go on then Sarah carry on that and I think that's really interesting Catherine and I think that that is often what I feel with language because I, I talk to a lot of people about kind of influencing and like on like 
and people support workers and people who are in places to influence and this is language is something that you can do right now you can change it right now you you it's your it's yours you can do it now you can examine it reflect on it start changing it right now and i think i, I used to work in in services um as a, as a coach working directly with people and it's to go into these meetings and and we were really as a team you know we were a pilot project delivering the personal transition service with mayday and we had a very strong idea of what our language was and that became very kind of much part of our identity as, as a team as a pilot trying to change something and going into those meetings and maintaining that language and being and kind of um so things like we just stopped using the word client and we went to meetings called client um, client meetings <laughs> and you're not using the word client anymore and that became something that people noticed they were like oh they're not using the word client and then it created a conversation and then that created that created a ripple effect of um, after a while, no one was using the word client because you started, you instigated it, you started kind of questioning it. And 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 then that leads to a bigger question, analysis of well, what does the word client mean and what does that mean for our, our practice? What does that mean for how we, do, we actually talk to people and deliver things? So it's kind of that instigator that right now changing something can, can have a really big effect. Definitely. And, and I think for me, so... I'm going to fess, fess up to something now since it's a, a kind of new system alliance and it's time to rethink the things we do. For a long time, I used to, and, and sometimes I still find myself doing it, I go, oh, does it really matter, you know, if we call people service users or clients or customers or um, citizens, you know, and, and i just being completely honest, you know, despite everything I've said about labels and, and kind of my personal understanding and experiences, because that's coming from a sort of policy person's perspective where I sort of think oh well we need to find some way when you're creating policy and you're kind of talking about people you you know there's that practical use of language where sometimes you need to identify a group of people that need a certain level of support um, so there's some really practical challenges I think to our use of, of language which will always stop us from making any big changes kind of so you know that's my own confession um but i think all of this has led to what kind of i'm going to sorry i should have said this at the beginning everyone we're going to have a sort of five minute break at 20 to 11 just for people to have a coffee uh, and then we'll go for the sort of last uh, 45 minutes um kind of and i'm thinking we've done the first 45 minutes as an exploration of kind of language and 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 kind of this sort of you know what does it feel like and i'd really like the last part to be you know so what we're going to do you know not necessarily have a plan or or a prescriptive response but actually what does it mean then you know what what impact does it have what does it look like uh, if we're starting to think differently about services um so we've got six minutes to do to this kind of more visceral stuff um so i was just going to say what do you think holds us back from doing it from me yeah sarah sorry to come in again i i just kind of picked up on that kind of um the practical use of language because I, I get that a lot people saying well i would i wouldn't say that to people that i'm working with but i have to say it when i'm in the system and i i have to use this language to, to do a bid and you know and you have that kind of like um divide between like they can't bring themselves into the system anymore because it's kind of well, I wouldn't I, I agree with you but I have to do this for the system so there's there's funding there's there's talking to like commissioners and that they, those those require language that they have control of when they're working directly with people but it then gets shifted in a different environment but I kind of really challenge that and say well if you're going to change your language then it needs to be you've changed your language wherever whatever setting you're in because if you because it doesn't for me changing language is signifying a difference in in the way you act in the way you view your your, your kind of um who you are in a sense so if that's changing between different settings and it's not a real change for me so um i don't know if that answers your question um but kind of maybe more the kind of systemic approach of language holds it back yeah great thanks sarah bryony um yeah totally i agree i think it it's very much that we, um, it's so embedded, isn't it? It's so embedded in our systems. Um, and it's very difficult to step, step back from that. I think people do sort of fear the change around that and um, fear what it means of having to kind of acknowledge that maybe they are gonna have to say, think about things a bit differently and talk about things in a bit of a different way. And um, I also think that the sort of whole divide of kind of labeling people as service users, um, customers, clients, whatever, in that and i've heard that a lot they sort of you need a, you need a label we need to be able to have a label to talk about people 
but why can't we just talk about us as people because we are all going to benefit from whatever these measures are whatever these bids for funding are they're they're about us and so rather than saying we're, we're just going to benefit them it should be about all of us so it's that shift from the kind of dividing into them and us to the us yeah uh, Catherine and then I'll bring Joe in if that's right thank you yeah just really quickly I'm just thinking about a particular um particular issue in, in talking about homelessness and it's this idea of well shouldn't we sort of meet people where they are in our communication so if people really recognize rough sleeping in connection with homelessness shouldn't we always talk about rough sleeping because that's what people recognize and therefore it's a it's the most uh, kind of uh, likely way that they will engage with our message the issue with that is that it doesn't help us to broaden the understanding of what homelessness is, of what forms it takes and who it affects. And it means that therefore the solution, the logical solutions in people's minds will be the narrow solutions that address only rough sleeping. So it's this real challenge between meeting people where they are or trying to broaden that understanding um, in communications. And that is a debate. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, and that is a massive debate, and I wonder if we can pick up on that kind of when we come back from the break, actually, and that would be a good launch point, Catherine, maybe if we hear from you after the break about that point and see what people think. Uh, Joe? Uh, yeah, just like, I don't, know if, <laughs> I don't know if this is really linked, but it was kind of what I was thinking when you were speaking. It's just, I just think there needs to be a lot more, like, um, like I know we're going to talk about later, but, but like just a lot more humanizing, and I don't even know if that humanizes the word, but like a lot more like if if you imagine this in any other situation, say you were I don't know, you you were introducing a friend to another friend, and you said like this is my uh, I don't know my companion who is a, a Romanian whatever, like you just never you would never like engage with someone like that, you would never like talk to them in a way. <laughs> Where you were just listing like facts about it, like like, and and I think that can be with homelessness as well. That like when I've yeah, like I, I would, I don't know if I was like volunteering somewhere and I got talking to someone, you you wouldn't yeah, and introduce them. I wouldn't say this is so and so, he's a whatever. You'd just be like, ah, oh, like um, I've been talking to Jeff and he's really into Aston Villa, like or something like. <laughs> like I just think there needs to be more of that like because again I, I just only talk about what I know but like I find it a lot in education more the labeling thing that like um especially with like additional needs and invisible disabilities and stuff the way it's like this kid's got ADHD like this this this, this is so and so he's got ADHD rather than like this is X and he's into this and I just and like yeah I, I don't know where I'm going with it in my head it makes <laughs> it makes sense but it's just like I just feel as yeah like if you took that if you took all this language and you applied it to another's social situation it would just be bonkers if you were like talking to like I don't know ordering a pint and you, uh, somewhere and you were like hello um service woman I would like I don't know it's just like it's just crackers like so I just think there needs to be a lot more and and I think the problem is that that's seen as unprofessional which is which is rubbish like because a lot I know a lot of funding again I only know about in the art world it's just like following a recipe it's like a crossword if you put these words in this order you'll probably get the funding and just like bouncing off what someone said earlier in the chat about activism and stuff like that like and this is kind of bouncing on what I was saying like um Noam Chomsky the like um social political like commentator he wrote an essay about how slang is like a form of rebellion and I think that's like a perfect example of how language can flip uh, depending on the situation like I don't know like my, like my, my girlfriend's family are Jamaican and they all say like bad as good and it's but like for most people that might be like so just the idea just like culturally it can shift so much as well so I just think it's hard to say how are we going to change the language because it's such like a universal culturally generational like phenomenon and stuff like that so yeah I just a few different points I just I was just really inspired by what you were saying so yeah yeah really helpful uh, so I'll, I'm going to wrap up uh, did you want to come in go on really quickly I just wanted to say that I totally totally agree that it needs to be more human and like just relax it all a little bit sometimes it feels so like tense and it's yeah. like you need to just relax and be human beings I just totally totally agree I just wanted to say that 
definitely yeah and it was really really powerfully made i mean i feel sorry for jeff joe being an aston villa fan but um you know it's probably nobody wants to be introduced like that i suppose i don't know is that the right thing to say i don't like football but i assume that's what people say um, <laughs> um but yeah that's perfect you know you want people to be introduced as the things you know i i, I might start doing it see how long it takes for people to i don't know punch me in the face i'll, I'll start introducing my friends as like I don't know all of their deficits and it'll be an interesting experiment um <laughs> anyway uh, before I humiliate myself anymore uh what I'm going to do then is if we come back at 10 47 specifically uh the use of language to direct people's time and break uh and then we'll start looking at some of the practical stuff and uh spoiler there might not be a huge amount because it's still a work in progress but at least we can start talking about some of the ideas so see you in five minutes
Oh, welcome back. I hope that was long enough. I apologize in advance. I think there's a cup of tea about to arrive. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's um, the label uh, known as my husband with a cup of tea. Um, anyway, sorry, that was, I hope that was a good enough save. Um, yeah, so I wanted to come to Catherine first then. Uh, I think you kind of posed us a really challenging question uh, just as we went on break. So I'd like to maybe see some of your reflections and maybe that could start some of the conversation. Thanks, Ollie. So I think you wanted us to start talking about what we can do. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. and you phrased it really interestingly okay. about um, whether we meet people where they are. Or, or whether we actually use the kind of language um, mm. power that we have to mm. drive some of that change. Yeah. So um, just on the kind of on the idea of meeting people where they are and working to, to move on um, thinking about homelessness towards what we would describe as the sort of sect of you. Um, and there's two things I wanted to mention about kind of meeting people where they are and that's that's using really commonly held and deeply held values when we talk about homelessness and also using metaphors that people understand to help us to describe why homelessness happens so we can use this thinking that people already have to help us communicate about homelessness and when when we've been talking about this idea of being more human um one of the most effective frames for talking about homelessness is this idea of home as a moral human right. So to treat everyone with dignity and respect means making sure that everyone has a home and everyone can afford a safe and stable place to live. And um, in our communications about homelessness, we can, we can humanize it by talking about human need, about home as a human need. And we can talk about how systems dehumanize people by denying access to basic support for basic human needs. Um, and and that, that kind of aspect of humanizing our language is really powerful for dislodging the idea that homelessness only matters to a small group of people who experience it. And actually it places the issue of homelessness in a much bigger context of well, it, ma it matters to all of us because we're all humans. And therefore it drives that sense of emotional connection with doing something about this because it's about our collective responsibility in society to treat everyone like a human being. Um, so I, I think we can take that idea of speaking with a humanizing voice in, in lots of different directions. That's just one idea. <laughs> I think I think that's really powerful, and you know, having looked obviously worked with you in a in a previous life um, on the sort of framework stuff, Catherine, it's really I, I find it really hopeful. But but I think it does also show how hard it is for organisations that are trying to survive, trying to deliver services for people, you know, trying to work in the backdrop of COVID, of overwhelmed frontline staff, of, of people who are um, just crying out for, for resources to actually do the stuff on the ground. We're asking a lot sometimes, um, I think, to ask people to not look at the here and now, but to take a risk on I don't know, fundraising language that dehumanizes or campaigning languages uh, that uses, you know, the most vulnerable or the most at risk. You know, we're asking a lot. And, that, and that's because, just going to get a little bit political now, um, that's because we live in a system which is driven by scarcity and driven by the need to try and claw what resources there are available. And so that, I think, makes it really hard for us to then say to people delivering services, oh, you will, you shouldn't say the most vulnerable because actually what that is doing is reinforcing, you know, all of that stuff we've talked about because I think people know that. So <laughs> to draw that point to conclusion, what I want to know, and, and I can see a lot of it is um, already in the, in, in the chat around funding applications, you know, that's where I think some of the crunch is. So for me, it's funding applications, it's uh, fundraising, 
and it's campaigning. Those are the three kind of big things with language. And obviously there's the stuff on the ground, which is, is how we talk to people <laughs> and engage with them, which is just as if not more important, but almost that's the stuff that can change if we've got the appetite and the energy for it. The st those three areas that I talked about, I think those are the really tricky ones because they're, they're the things that box us as services, as people, as organizations into that weird way of working where we talk about, like just the, I, I was reflecting in the five minutes to break about the idea of customers and clients. I mean, you know, it, people don't go to, um, I don't know, housing options or their um, counsellor and kind of go with a suite of, you know, with like a menu, you know, or we'll have the therapeutic intervention today, thank you, with the extra side of substance misuse stuff. You know, like people just don't go as customers. So yeah, there's just so much about it, but I can see, I think I can see, yes, Sarah about to come in. Thank you for saving me from my ramble. Um, no, I was, I was kind of thinking, I feel like, and I'm going to go back to my um, person-led versus person-centred thing, because I think that this is a really interesting thing. Why I feel like language gives us the opportunity for, because it might not be the, there's a, it's a very complicated kind of systemic problem. And language for me always feels like the, the the front of it is kind of we're seeing it through language kind of the back problems that are going on but language i feel is an area where we can learn so so really actually get down to debate okay what does person-led and person-centered mean because then we learn about what the impact of that language is and the actual practice that is happening as a result of it so with person-centered this is an exact Personal versus person is an exact debate I have in, in my training <laughs> that I've delivered in, in the training I've delivered, which is interesting that it came up because person centered often comes out well, services wrap around an individual, an individual has lots coming around it, and there's more services involved. And actually, does that give that does that empower the individual? Does that allow them to have control of the situation? Whereas person led tends to have be more simple in terms of it's led by the person. And, and that difference in language can be quite powerful so for me I don't know if language is kind of the solution but I feel like it has a lot of potential for us to learn about what we're actually doing if we just drill down into it and reflect on it yeah Bryony yeah I totally agree Sarah and I think it's I think just having the conversations is really important the fact that we are talking about it because it does matter and if you it's only really by talking about it and like the person-led person-centered thing I agree and I've had exactly the same conversation um and it's only really by sort of really delving into that and I'm picking that and there's a, that's a bit of the reasons I started writing a blog really because I don't think I was trying to have those conversations and I was finding it really difficult to kind of engage people who are just like well why it doesn't really matter what, what impact does it make and um so by writing about it I could sort of explore some of those keywords like service user and customer and assessment and all of those things in real detail and kind of really work out why they really made me feel uncomfortable and um, what it was about that. So yeah, I think it, I think sort of really exploring it does matter, and it is it is important to look in and sort of do that horrible cliche deep dive <laughs> approach to really unpicking the difference. And then yeah, person led much better than person centered. Yeah, and I, I yeah, that's a really you know, and I think I suppose what I'll I'll pause here and just put a line in the sand and say I think we've established I hope anyway with people watching that language matters and I think if that's the only thing we take from today I'd be a bit disappointed but at least we would have an agreement that language matters you know even when sometimes you know people on the front line are busy you know people are overworked there's not enough people sometimes to do the work that's needed and you know I've, I've been there, you know, in a meeting with, with kind of government officials or people and you'd sort of think, oh, do I really need to have this debate about person-led or person-centred? And your heart sinks because it's a big debate and it's complicated and it's painful. And actually, really, you're trying to argue for, you know, a change in policy that will make life different for the people you see in front of you or, you know, you've got people who are are looking to you for kind of, I don't know, support or guidance, you know, whatever situation you're in, I, I get that these conversations can seem sometimes like they are a bit up there and away from people on the ground. My counter to that and to myself, I think, is that that's, excuse the language, but that's bullshit. <laughs> it's just not true. Um, and that's as much to myself as it is to anyone on this call or anyone else outside, because 
what I need to remind myself all the time in these conversations is that it does matter because there will be people um, throughout services uh, and people who can't even reach services because they're so alien to them that language is just a constant barrier. So I think that's a, a kind of, and I'll probably keep reminding people about that every sort of five or 10 minutes until we finish, until you get really bored of me. Um, what I wanted to do is pause and, oh, sorry, Joe, do you want to come in? No, cheers, man. Uh, just, yeah, like, just bouncing off your point, just, um, there was like two things. There was one of like, I think you, you're saying about like, everyone agrees that language matters, which I think is awesome. And I think it's just why, why, why it matters and why people are doing it. Cause like, I have a personal opinion that sometimes, like, I so I have like, le- this is where I can say every label and it, invisible disabilities, I have learned the difficulties, blah, blah, blah. but basically, like, um, and yeah, so I, I struggle to like write and I struggle, um, uh, to read and stuff. And I often find that uh, someone talked about funding earlier, I just want to say that like, something's got to shift with the funding because it's so like it's so like mathematical and whatever, where like, I know if I put an application in, it might not be like grammatically, whatever. And I've guaranteed that would have something to do with it. So there's gotta be some more accessibility for people like myself, where language isn't just, even though I'm a poet or whatever, uh, but the language isn't my strongest, um, like uh, like written language isn't my strongest thing. And just the thing about why, cause I think, I personally believe, this is just completely my opinion, that sometimes people use certain language to be like the most woke, person in the room like to be the most like whether you want to call it pc or the most like 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 kind of intelligent person and really you're doing it to make someone feel better like that that's what i think you're doing it to the person you're describing or the person you're engaging with might feel a bit better about it and i just think there's a thing of why we're doing it it's not it's like we're not doing it to like i don't know to like make yourself sound really clever it's about thinking why is it important it's important because if i call this young person disadvantage and I just call them a young person that they're probably going to be like oh I've, I've had my whole life being like told I'm this and I'm that and you're just talking to me like I'm a human uh, I'm a, uh, just a kid or I've never been called like a talented young person before or whatever like it is I'm sorry I'm just using my like work as an analogy um but yeah same same I, I imagine the same with the homelessness like if if, 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 if you just if, you know like um this homeless person this person or whatever, like, yeah, and the suffering thing is a real thing that annoys me, more so with disabilities, like, I've been introduced as, like, someone that suffers with dyslexia, and it's like, I don't get up and be like, oh, another day of, like, being dyslexic, or whatever, like, like I don't, like, suffer, it's not like an ache, <laughs> it's like, I've had my tooth out, and I'm suffering with that, more than I suffer with learning difficulties, um, but yeah, just a bit of a ran- ramble, but yeah, I just think there's a big thing of why, why it's important, and I really believe that compassion is why it's important, it's not because it makes us sound like Einstein or something like that. It's just that it makes people feel better who we're engaging with. Yeah. Yeah. I and also Joe, if if you take anything away from today, please never apologize because nothing you're saying is in rambling in any way. It's like breaking it all open. So thank you so much. I just yeah, please don't apologize anymore. Um I'll, I know I've seen all three panelists put their hands up. I think um one of the things I've, I've waited years to kind of formulate this in my head, um, and I'm just going to go for it. But one of these ideas I've had a long time ago is this idea of freedom and language and freedom of speech. And you know, I don't want to get us too far over into that because that's going to open a whole different kind of worms. But one of the things that I've always wanted to say, so let's go for it, is I think the more power you have, the less freedom you should have. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's talk about language. So I think if you're at the top of the triangle, if you're uh, the prime minister, your words probably have more of an impact. I don't think that's right, but it's true. Your words have more of an impact on services, on people, on the country than mine do. So you've got a duty then to maybe have less freedom of speech. You can't, as a prime minister, just go in and say whatever you like to anyone because because you have power and therefore you have to use your language more carefully. So, so that's kind of one of the other things. I wonder if if we start seeing the system as its set of power imbalances. So if you're the lead commissioner for mental health services in a local authority, your use of language has a power at the top of a triangle to influence how services are built, how people access services. So actually your freedom to use your language needs to be not curtailed by any kind of weird bureau of language, but you need to think about it. You need to be aware of what that power of language can do. And if you're on the bottom, and I don't think that is the case, but if you are, then actually, you know, use the language in the way you want and you can use that to access 
you know, whatever you want, you know, whether it's a certain service, whether it's where you want to live your life and all of that. Uh, definitely never Prime Minister Ewan. Um, anyway, so I think I wrote down the order, Bryony, then Catherine, and then Sarah. Um, yeah, I think that's a useful point, Oliver. I think there is there's a lot of power, isn't there, in, in language and the way that language is used and the sort of responsibility that comes with that as well. And um, I think the, the point I was going to make was about um, if we're going to try and sort of change and get to a better place and a more human system, then a key part of that is listening. And I think the, if you if you don't change the language and if you don't get rid of the labels, then you can't listen properly because they are kind of coming in with so many assumptions to start with. And the stereotypes that are sort of forming opinions and thoughts in your mind before you've even met someone obviously because they've got so many labels applied to them and you're starting with a I mean I think this, this whole kind of concept of not just having a conversation when you don't really know anything about somebody and you haven't got any labels and you're just genuinely interested in, in who they are and their own story is that's where we should be starting from not starting from this person or the labels that are attached to this sort of this vulnerable individual, this vulnerable service user who can't do this and has problems with this and has been diagnosed with this, puts you in a very different place. So if you're just starting with like, this is Steve and let's have a chat. Yeah, great. Thanks, Primey. Uh, Catherine. Thanks, Ollie. I just wanted to pick up what you were saying about, about kind of those in power um, and thinking about how at Crisis and at other organisations, we've gone about trying to embed this new way of talking about homelessness in our organisation. And, and one of the most important things that we, we can do is, is um, framing training and practice with our spokespeople, with those people who, are, who have the highest profile voices out there talking to um, institutions, but also talking to the media. And, um, and supporting those people to be able to get really practiced and really natural in using new ways of talking about homelessness is really powerful. Um, so I would recommend any organization thinking about how can we embed this in what we do to, to make sure that absolutely there's that, there's that bottom up that, that, everyone involved, that everyone is involved, but it's really key to look at those who have that really high profile voice. Thanks, Catherine. That, yeah, brilliant. Uh, Sarah? Uh, yeah, no, I was because I, I do, I really, I think that I agree that looking at the whole kind of spectrum of everybody and how they look at language. But um, my, my original point was kind of going off what, what Joe said in terms of what, why are we, why are we talking about this? What, why is this important? And it's important because it affects people's lives. You know, people are in, like, in, like dragged down by these labels and like entrenched in systems. Um, and you know, I, I used to work with people, and we would just have um, in sat in, in Oxford on the streets, just having a conversation, and it just being normal and, and real, and just having real human connection with people. But they're so they've been in systems that have put so many labels on them; they just feel like they're not capable of doing things. They're not capable of managing their own tenancy because they've been kind of deemed as not tenancy ready. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of the I think it's kind of not getting away from the real impact that this language has on people that people are, are stuck in this language um, and it's put on them. And yeah, I suppose I didn't want to lose the, that and kind of what Joe had said around really holding on to why are we talking about this? And we're talking about this because it's not, the systems are not okay and it's not okay that this is happening and that's why we need to change it. Yeah, definitely. And I was, <laughs> I was just trying to work out what, and um, there was a point, it's gone out of my head, which I'll, if I remember it, I'll come back mm -hmm. to it. Um, but I wanted to spend a bit of time on some of the questions that have come in as well. I'd really like any of your views on, on some of them. So, I mean, the first one I, I, that I've just seen, it hasn't come through as a question, but I can't see who it is, but JAC and then dot, 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 um, about uh, an interesting experience being uh, part of a panel uh, that gave out funding. And um, they, they um, from the look of it, they, they were pushing for, you know, kind of not necessarily going for the most emotional bid, the most sort of well-written, powerful knockout bid, you know, all of the stuff that I think some people have talked about, trauma and poverty porn and stuff like that, you know, but actually looking about what difference it would make, you know, and I, and I think that's something where language is really important. And yeah, something I've been worried about for a while, I suppose, that someone who's 
got an English literature degree and can write well or someone who doesn't and can just write really powerfully or whatever, you know, can just come in and use some nice little flowery words and, you know, a few uh, n dash or a hyphen, you know, people who know the or the grammatical right stuff, which I just don't. I've, I've always just guessed at grammar and hopefully got it right. <laughs> um, you know, they get the funding. And then actually people who are kind of working at the grassroots who are actually delivering totally different services people who haven't been trained in writing bids in the you know so i was just wondering what kind of your thoughts were, were on that as a, as a panel if you have any uh Bryony, then joe I think it comes back to what Catherine was saying earlier about um, the shared values, really, and kind of appealing to those shared values, because those are, at the end of the day, those are kind of what, what matters to all of us, aren't they? The, and then if you can kind of pin it back on that, then it is, it's something that's going to make a difference to everybody, and then it, it makes it more real as well. And also just using stories. I mean, again, I think I like you, Oliver, in terms of the, the grammar and everything. I just, I kind of guess and go with what sounds right. Um, but I think it is the power of power of stories and having and having that space for people to tell their stories is really important. Great. Joe. Um, yeah, it was more just about the point about the funding. I know I kind of hinted on it with that. But yeah, I think there just needs to be a real like um uh dismantling or like moving of the goalposts of like how people can access that. Cause I just do think it is so limiting towards um toward people like myself that struggle to put pen on paper and stuff like that or like uh, grammar and stuff. Um, so yeah, I was mainly just thinking about the point of that, but um, yeah, like the stories is like a, an awesome, awesome point as well uh, as as well. Like there's there's like like okay, without going off on a ramble, like um, so like when I teach like lyric writing, I try and teach kids about rap and poetry. Rap R A P means rhythm and poetry. But if you told a kid they like poetry, they'd walk out of the room. But if they like rap, they like it. So it's just that thing of like um. Where am I going with this? Just that thing, of like, just really uh, being able to, like, just move. Sh yeah, like, the, there needs to be a shift in, like, the standard, if that makes sense, of, like, when it comes to, like, the, I'm just talking about the bids. Like, that, like, if you wrote a story about how this project is so important, like, or um, that, that should be just as valid as, like, a really, like, uh, like a dissertation or something like that. I just think there needs to be a bit of a, like a shift in that, like, um, and whether that's also like um, uh, a verbal communication as well. Um, my, my cousin did a degree in um, linguistics. Um, he's really, really clever, like way clever than me. But he, um, and he did his thing about how we judge through accents and stuff like that. And he did like a thing of, he got these people to read the same statement and it was about a crime. And, they, and people had to guess which one they thought did it purely by listening to the voice. And, and it was actually Brummy and Northern Irish, the two, the two untrusted ones, which I'm both. My granddad was from Belfast. And uh, like, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, just how like the cultural impact as well of like the perceptions just through verbal language and stuff. I think that comes off in, um, in, 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 in the bid stuff, mainly from a class thing where if you have someone that might speak in a more street or slang way, that, that immediately might mean like unintelligent. Or something like that when it's just not like like and I just think there's yeah I think it's a minefield man but I just think there needs to be like you just need to like burn the whole thing down <laughs> and then like say like we're starting again kind of thing so yeah great uh, Sarah I'll bring you in really quickly if that's okay because I want to get to a couple of the other questions yeah I was just gonna say yes I think and my point is not constructive I just feel like this isn't it crazy there's this disconnect between kind of funders and like what's actually happening and it's not a constructive point it's just more of a rant point <laughs> and, and also kind of yeah burn it down a bit Joe I agree yeah thanks and um, someone else has kind of prompted this as well in the group but it came through as a um question already so um do we all as charities and organizations have a responsibility to check our language in marketing comms, particularly around fundraising. And someone else in the chat has talked about sort of things like Christmas appeals, you know, the, the kind of stigmatizing language. So I'm glad you put your uh, paper up first, Catherine, because I was going to come to you anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I'd really like to see what kind of hear a bit maybe about what crisis has done maybe in, in that and then hear the rest of the panel. Absolutely in terms of having the responsibility in, in all of our communications and especially um, in those fundraising appeals 
campaigns that are our most high profile thing that we are doing that reaches the most people um and just a couple of things i wanted to say in in relation to that is that they are uh, fundraising campaigns as the most high profile thing that we're doing are a huge opportunity to tell a different story but also um quite understandably um there is risk because they're all about raising enough money to do the work that we need that we need to do and um using fundraising campaigns to introduce some of the framing recommendations that we have would move people away potentially from from what's been practiced before in significant ways um, in terms of how homelessness is portrayed, who is reflected. And I think um, as well as talking about language, we're really talking about imagery here um, in, these, in these campaigns and looking at how we can broaden the understanding of who's affected by homelessness, moving away from reinforcing the stereotype of the middle-aged man who has a drug and alcohol problem and broadening the understanding of homelessness affecting different types of groups and being experienced in different ways. Um, and at Crisis, I, I've been working at Crisis since March um, and have um, been delighted to be involved really closely in developing fundraising campaigns this year. Um, I worked on a, our appeal in September, which is led by a group of crisis members um, telling their stories, which was, I think, really interesting and fantastic example of using stories, which is what we were, what we were just talking about, to really surface the systems and structures and circumstances that people are living within and the power that those systems have upon upon people's lives and how they limit options and then looking at how the solutions help what do the solutions do to relieve pressure to stop being pushed into people being pushed into homelessness so i think stories are hugely powerful in these types of campaigns but it's just taking a different approach to a story not being so highly individualistic focusing on people's behavior or the choices that they've made, but actually trying to look at it through a wider lens and trying to see how this affects more than one person, trying to bring that through. Um, and in the fundraising campaign work that I've been doing this year with Crisis on Christmas, we've been looking at tweaking words, adding, adding values in where we can, making small changes to edge, edge towards practicing the framing recommendations that we have um, and even I even those making those small changes and moving towards moving through that process is really really important so there's definitely potential in those fundraising campaigns to do to do this work absolutely great thanks Catherine um, unless pe other people want to come in I'm trying to get oh there we go Sarah sorry I keep coming in um, yeah, I think as well around comms, I think a really important element to look at is that ownership the language has over people in comms, because often it's kind of people's um, achievements that, uh, that what they have actually done is, is kind of um, colonised by a lot of organisations as, as their outcomes. And it's kind of how do we, and I, I've never written a fundraising thing, and I think it would be very, it's very difficult to do, but I suppose it's how do we make sure that we're not kind of owning people in that sense and and people are their own that they're themselves and organizations don't have ownership over their life outcomes you know and it's kind of how do we how do we manage that i don't have the answers but it's more it's more just kind of um really being aware of ownership of people in language yeah and i think um i'm really sorry i can't remember who said this which is awful um i think it was catherine um almost kind of looking at who's got the power um, and kind of in terms of who's got the influence in terms of your spokespeople or the people that are doing the talking for your organisation. Um, and, and kind of, I'm not sure if this is what you meant, Catherine, but what I got from it is almost like a power and influence map within your organisation, I think is a really good way of maybe taking this forward, is thinking, actually, if our organisation wants to make these changes, well, we can't change overnight just with a click of a finger. So we need to be really targeted. So 
So let's first of all get people on board who want to make those changes and, and build that kind of critical mass of people within the organization or within your friendship circle or wherever. But then look at the people who are the gatekeepers of comms, like Sarah is saying, you know, about key people who almost have that ownership and work with them and understand the pressures they're under. Because I think this is the key point that I'm building to is comms and fundraising and marketing and campaigning, they are within the system as well. And they're trying to do their thing within the system, which is to uh, either make policy change uh, for people, uh, to make our world a better place, or they're trying to fundraise so that charities can continue to offer services that maybe the government doesn't feel are popular. So, you know, if we look at kind of the start of a lot of the domestic abuse services, for example, you know, a lot of those were from private philanthropy or fundraising before government started properly funding, properly funding uh, services for women. So there's nothing evil or intrinsically wrong about fundraising, and it plays a really key part in trying to drive forward services that are unpopular or that aren't a priority or that are just kind of being swept under the rug by our white patriarchal society. Um, so for me, it's about recognizing that people are, we're all part of the same system and that system, you know, and, and our comms co colleagues and fundraising campaigning colleagues are not, they're not part of the system in the sense they're not our enemies. So we need to work with them and understand what they're trying to do and bring them into our journey as well. So I think that's kind of what I've got from that because yeah, without fundraising, there would be so many services uh, that didn't exist. And I know I'm doing the big, big no-no in terms of the new system alliance talking about services but what i mean by that is support for people that wouldn't otherwise exist and i think it's really important i use services as shorthand for all of that and i need to challenge my own language in that sense so i think i know the answer for, to the next question but i just wanted to give you a nice easy one maybe um so question from the chat are we overthinking it I mean, I'll start and say no. <laughs> um, so I think that's sometimes what it can look like from the outside. I think, um, you know, particularly drawing back on that person-led versus person-centered tweet, um, which someone's put in the Q&A as well, but we've talked that to death, so I won't address it again. Um, you know, I think it looks sometimes like we're overthinking it. You know, um, I, I remember, um, <laughs> so, I have, for example, on a personal level, I have a huge issue with the, uh, you know, the word queer, for example, you know, and a lot of my LGBT plus friends uh, embrace that term massively and they love it. And uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with the way they're obsessed with it. It's amazing. I love it. And I just can't, I can't touch that word because for me, it's so messy and horrible and traumatic. I, I just can't use it because when I hear the word, it kind of is the word that used to follow me around corridors and everywhere. Um, so I just can't use it in that way. But for me, you know, for me to understand my own community, the LGBT community and the issues they face and that kind of reclaiming of words and that real pride within the LGBT community, you have to do some overthinking <laughs> because overthinking has got this negative. I'm just going to go on a ramble there. Sorry. But overthinking has got this negative connotation that you're overthinking as in you're doing too much thinking but actually some things need a lot of thinking <laughs> so that's kind of my long rambling answer to a very short straightforward question um so i don't know if anyone uh Catherine and then sarah um again no i don't think we're thinking it but i i i think it i think it's um making the examination of language like part of just of your culture part of what you do you know just just having it as something that's naturally you're asking questions about it so it's not it's not a separate exercise to sit down and overthink about a specific word it's more part and it's and it's not going to be done we're not going to reach this kind of wonderful set of language that's that's brilliant and we all, and we're all kind of great with it and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to we're going to get it wrong and, and and we're going to learn from that and actually this is about for me it's not about overthinking or unthinking about it's about thinking about it because sometimes we're just not even thinking about it <laughs> so it's kind of really asking questions and exploring it and having it part of your culture to, to have this as a conversation and, and learn from it feels feels like that's the important thing for me thanks yeah Catherine I saw you raise your hand so I'll bring you in a second but could I also add just to make that answer a bit complicated um 
I think Robert has asked, uh, how does an organization as big as crisis balance the need for fundraised income versus a strength and asset based campaign, which I know you kind of touched on, but and, and if it's not something you go into huge amount of detail today, um, I'm happy for you to kind of maybe share some links. Um, but yeah, do you want to come in? Yeah, I'm just, um, I'll just respond to those two, the two things, the overthinking and the second question. Um, I don't think we are overthinking it, but what, what I do think is that um, having framing evidence, having an evidence base makes our thinking easier because it gives us, uh, it gives us a framework for want of a better word to repeat frameworks all the time. It gives us a framework to think about this. It gives us a structure. And it gives us um, it gives us things to look for, and it gives us ideas for what we can do. So it should help our thinking and and help direct it, um, rather than a sense of kind of going around in circles or, or kind of um, overthink overthinking. Um, and on the balance, the question about balance um, and strengths-based work um, in those in those campaigns, it, it, I would say that it is a process, and that we are at crisis working towards um, working towards doing that as much as we can. And if you if you look back at, at campaigns from many years ago, the shift is the shift is really really noticeable. Um, and one of the most um, one of the most heartening things, I guess, when I when I joined a crisis at the beginning of the year was I did I did interviews with lots of members of the team of, of different teams, including fundraising and and other um, teams involved in that kind of work. And there was huge support for for looking at framing. So and so I think everyone can feel the potential um, and feel the power of it. So it's it's really looking at what type of communication you're doing, what audiences you're talking to, and thinking about how we can apply the big concepts in ways that work for those different channels and those different communications um, objectives. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Bryony? Um, yeah, just back to the overthinking it. Um, no, <laughs> we're not overthinking it. Um, I, I kind of think about it all the time. But um, I think what we don't want to do is over-police it and make it to the point where nobody where people are scared to kind of say anything or have conversations we need to have that ability to talk about it and understand why it's important and hear what people's different opinions are and, and value those different opinions so if we kind of police it too much then we shut down that conversation which is obviously not what we want at all great thank you so there are loads more questions and i'm really sorry everyone i've, I've kind of try to follow as much of the chat as possible. And, and I know there's loads of really rich questions which we just don't have time to address today. But uh, I promise you that, you know, you're part of the new System Alliance now. And if you're not, join. Um, and we will be having these conversations as part of that. You know, I don't think we can change any system um, unless we change the language that we use to talk about it. So for the last five minutes, um, I was just gonna kind of come to um, all of you um, and kind of just ask for a few seconds of reflection. Uh, and then I'll just wrap up with a few things I found and I might then give the last word to Joe if that's okay, Joe. But um, so yeah, uh, Sarah. Um, I think it's been, it's been really lovely to spend such a chunk of time examining this. So uh, it's been good, but yeah, I think for me, it's just about continuing that conversation. And I think building what Riley said, not policing it, but really exploring it and learning and using it as a, as a tool to really embed something different um, and work towards a new system. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? I agree. Um, I agree with everything that Sarah just said about the, the time we've spent um, talking about this. It's really heartening how many people want to join in with this. Um, and also that I completely agree with the policing point. This is all about um, finding natural ways that work for us to talk in this new way, to find creative ways that work for our different organisations um, so that we're not all saying exactly the same thing. We're saying it in a way that works for us. Thank you. And Bryony? 
Um, yeah, just to echo Sarah and Catherine, it's been an amazing opportunity to just have like this concentrated time talking about things that we're all really passionate about. Um, I think just a kind of a word of caution, I suppose, is that we don't we don't want to just change the language. It's easy to change language and then think that we've made a change. So saying something strength based or saying we've been person centered or co-produced, they're words that are just thrown out there now. And um, so we need to have the action as well as the changing the language. We need to change the system too. Yeah, and that's a really key point for me. Um, this is just a really important part of a whole mix of changes, big, big structural changes we need to make. Uh, you know, we're not tinkering around the edges, and but we can't build a better world unless we know how to talk when we're in it. Uh, and I would just echo exactly all of the stuff you said about policing. And I think I would reflect on that, all of us. And I can see um, Pete in the chat has talked about using the word reflecting instead of thinking. And I really like that. Um, you know, I think if we reflect on some of the way we challenge people, some of the way we drive things forward, some of the way we compete with each other, some of the way we kind of endorse these old ways of working. I think if we look at our language, language reflects thought. So let's look at our language and change the way we think about things. Because I'm a weird person who loves practical things, I just thought I'd share, I was taking notes, which is why occasionally you see me looking away. So there's a few things that I've got from that chat before I bring Joe in to finish. Sorry, Joe, to put you on the spot. It's absolutely okay if you don't want to, but I just think um, apologies to everyone else on the panel, but you've been brilliant. And I want to listen to one more of your rambles before we finish. Um, so, you know, one of the things um, I think I've heard is just do it, you know, just make a start. Like alongside that goes, you know, don't be afraid of getting it wrong, but let's not police each other. Um, know where the power is and use language and get the people with power to use language in an effective way that actually drives that change. Let's change the funding and commissioning. We can't do it overnight, but let's make sure people in those positions of power understand language and are ready to um, get a funding bid that isn't grammatically correct, that isn't uh, incredibly emotionally punchy, but actually might come from someone like Joe said with dyslexia or someone with a learning uh, disability or anything. You know, that's really important. Uh, fundraising, take a risk, make those changes. You know, even if it's a small thing, you're making a world a bit better. Don't be afraid to be BPC. You know, people, exactly someone in the comments said, um, you know, or it's seen as a, um, a pejorative way, word, you know, like, oh, you know, you can't be to PC. Well, just, just do it because PC is being kind. Um, don't uh, over police it. We've talked about that. Also, I love someone saying about examining language, making sure we've got a space to normalize the talking about language. We've done an hour and a half of it today. Um, you know, and I still feel like we've barely scratched the surface. So normalize it, talk about it in your organization, debate it, argue about it. Um, and I really liked one. This is such a seems like a really mundane way to finish, but my first job was in marketing, so this is why. <laughs> Add the normalizing and changing of language to your branding guidelines. You know, don't just have your branding guidelines being your hex colors and your you know, all your kind of RGBs and your CMYKs, have your branding guidelines be about how we talk about people and how we engage people. I think that's an incredibly important point. And then one last two things. One is be kind. I think that's the key one that came through as well today. And the final one that I started with and I'll finish with is language does matter. It makes a difference to people every single day and it really matters. So don't let it not matter in your organization or in your own heart. So thank you everyone. And I'll pass over to Joe. Uh, please join the new Assistant Alliance if you haven't. Uh, be part of a really great kind of movement uh, where we can support each other to make these changes. And thank you for your time today, Joe. Um, I'm guessing it's probably best if I quickly do a poem, but I might just have to pull it up off my screen. Is that okay? I'll rattle through it. Uh, yeah. Um, right. I've just got to get it because I haven't performed it in ages. Uh, so um, this piece um, is something which I writ, wrote, whatever the word is, talk about language, <laughs> I don't know what the word is. Um, uh, for, for May Day, a while ago, I've been having conversations uh, with people uh, in um, various um uh, who worked with them basically that's all I'm going to say we're we'll talking about breaking things down so yeah and uh, the more I was thinking about today this one's kind of a bit relevant to what we talk about so I'll quickly rattle through it now um, judging a book by its cover when it's the stories inside that matter 
Some are left on the shelf, long forgotten. If you're not willing to read the pages, you're the problem. We need to change the track on this stereotype. Some track records skip, but don't believe the hype. Treating it like it's a path or occupation. It's close to home, forgive the pun. But all one mistake, one debt, one loss, one problem from this situation. Could be any of our positions. Can't all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Maybe having some compassion, perhaps. And yeah, I said it. I'm talking about love. I don't burn incense sticks or release white doves, but more love is the root of it. Don't need a bottle of pills and a form to fill in. How about a warm drink and how are you doing? Subject of homelessness become so heartless. Separate, discriminate, divide, paralyze, demoralize those fallen on hard times not nameless hopeless how about hate less so you lose your humanity if you don't own property like russian dolls it's a part of us all from the big to the small as if from grace we can't fall and arrogance is fed to us all around in a society that orders us to look down burn witches on reality tv worship cribs on mtv do we praise profit that deeply martyrs and money let's talk on the street level spare a little change but we throw money into fast food chains corporate titans rampaging monsters i'll have a mock millionaire to go Spare little change, I don't think so We spit and snarl on this race of rats No time for those that are caught in traps We don't matter if you come first or last If you're in the rat race, you're still a bloody rat we let four walls define our DNA and when someone falls down, that's where they stay. Left behind these division times, conquer and divide, 55% rise and cuts, deleting cells on the spreadsheet, just figures and statistics, devouring our own cannibalistic cut. The very word means to wound or remove. They tell us it's to improve. Up the bill for electrical, can't afford the light at the end of the tunnel. Branded with a label, a stamp to tell the tale, all about the I, not about the we. Nothing to do with me, invisible people do we choose not to see. Given a piece in the checkboard of society, Checkmate by the state, prisoners of history. Well, if you label yourself, that's all you can be. All about the I, not about the we. Count me out of this community. All about the I, not about the we. Invisible people, do we choose not to see? Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm denying age. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe, again, and everyone. And have a lovely rest of the day. And I hopefully see some of you at uh, the session at 2 pm later today. <laughs>